Wowzers! Probably the most powerful podcast we have ever recorded. Not necessarily to help you catch more fish, but if you want to do something in the fishing world, maybe start your own company, whether it be you know an apparel company out there, or you want to be a YouTuber, or you want to be a charter captain, or you want to have like a digital media company like us. We literally cover everything that we have learned. We go through all the hurdles and even all the mistakes that we've made along the way, all the money that we have literally just burned and wasted along the way so that you don't have to make it. So I promise you, if you're interested in maybe at some point or even tomorrow, leaving your job or quitting your job and doing something on your own or with a group of people in the fishing industry, then listen to this entire thing or watch this entire thing. You're going to get a lot of awesome tidbits from this. All the stuff I wish that I knew when we made the leap. Enjoy. Salt Strong Nation, this is going to be an awesome podcast. We have had a lot of different requests for things like this in terms of, hey, you know, how did you guys do it? Like, you know, what were the biggest mistakes you guys made? What should I expect? How do I grow a business? How do I get customers? And if you haven't caught on by now, this is all about how to start a new fishing company. And we're going to cover everything from how to basically start and grow companies like ours, like digital companies, to if you're going out and you want to be a charter captain or really anything in the fishing world. We've kind of seen it all in the three years we've been doing it. We've learned a lot. We've made a ton of mistakes and uh, we're going to share this with you. So this would be a really, really uh, powerful podcast for any of you out there that do want to try something here in the near future. So I'm Joe Simons, and we've got Lukey. You there? I'm here. I'm on my phone this time. We'll see if it works. Uh, so far, so good. The old computer has been having some issues. So got to, got to, got to use the phone. Backup plan. Plan B. Oh yeah. Well, it's. Um... One of those uh, technology things that we just have to deal with, isn't it, as a digital company? We'll talk about Part that. Of as, it. We'll talk about that as well in this podcast. Yep. So before we get into it, I want you all to know that this podcast is sponsored by the Salt Strong Insider Fishing Club. If you want to find more spots, if you want to know the trends and understand the biology of the fish better so that you can start predicting where the fish will be all year long, if you want to have more fun and create more memories out on the water, then I urge you to please go join the Salt Strong Insider Fishing Club. It's where the good go to get better and the best go to become the very, very, very best out there. And it's just been really, really fun place where we have seen some serious transformations and and the people who do join it's been um it's been pretty awesome and we'll talk about that on this podcast as well if you want to learn more go to saltstrong.com forward slash podcast so i want to start this podcast off with a quote and it's a really really powerful quote by mark twain and it ties in with one of the Probably the most popular question we got, because uh, I, I did put a post on our inner Facebook group uh, asking people, "Hey, what questions do you have? Here's here's the here's the topic. What do you have?" And a lot of them were, "Oh, I just you know, how do I convince my wife? Um, you know, is there ever a perfect time, etc." And here is what our friend Mark Twain said: Twenty years from now, you will be more disappointed by the things that you didn't do than by the ones you did. So throw off the bow lines, sail away from the safe harbor, catch the trade winds in your sails, explore, dream, discover. Dude, that gave me goosebumps. It's powerful. And, And I will never, ever poke fun at the people that say, oh, my wife won't let me do it, or, you know, there's just never a good time because man we were there luke and i you you and i have both been there different points in our life i was married you weren't so we've we've seen it from both sides and there is never a perfect time i I remember the one guy it was one of our very first posts and the thing was you know why two brothers quit their six-figure jobs to teach world how to fish i still remember it that was in early 20 2015 and this guy was kind of mouthing off a little bit. And it turns out, you know, he did have a pretty cool dream to start a company. And I think he was a little bit jealous that, that we had done it. And his whole point was, oh, yeah, it's, it's easy to start a company when you're making six figures. 
And, and, and I, I ended up replying back to this guy. And the truth is, it's not easy. It's never easy. So, and, and here's why. If you're making six figures or even seven or eight figures, no one in life likes to go backwards. No one likes to risk everything to lose it all. And, and you know, they, they interviewed millionaires, people that have between five and 10 million. And the vast majority, like 80% of them said they weren't wealthy. These are people that have between five and $10 million in their bank accounts, and they did not think they're wealthy. That's because they're always looking up to the people who have yes. billions or whatever the number might be. And, and it's I, just human nature. It is yeah, hum- it's totally it's human nature. Absolutely human nature. And, and I, I told him back, I was like, man, it's, it's a whole lot easier to go start your dream job when you're unemployed and don't have a job. And he made a good point. He's like, well, no, that's when you actually just want a little comfort. Like that's when you want just a guaranteed income. Like that's when you're looking, you know, for just, just something to hold on to. And so I can see that side of the story. But my point is there's never going to be a perfect time, whether you're completely dead broke and you don't have a job, or if you're making multiple six figures, there's never, ever a perfect time. It's just like having a kid. I don't think anyone said we found the exact perfect time, the exact perfect day to have a kid. It's impossible. And, and so I want you to to know right off the bat, that is one of the most critical things is there is never going to be a perfect time. If your heart's telling you to do it, stinking do it. Listen yeah, to Mark, if you're, listen if you're to Mark waiting, Twain. Yeah, for anybody who's waiting for the perfect time, it, it'll it just it'll never happen. They'll just keep doing whatever they're doing. So yeah, just that's a, that is definitely a big thing to not focus on. There will never be a perfect time. Either you have a have a plan that's going to work, or you don't. And, and there's only really one way to find out if that's the case, and that's just by trying it, by giving it a shot. Yeah. Let me let me tell you another quick story, and this is a really really powerful story. I was in Lawrenceville, Georgia, uh, when we we first were you know talking about starting Salt Strong. And Luke and I had been in the financial services industry for a while. I'd been there for almost 13 years at the time and had done really well. I, I was literally like hitting my peak, like in terms of earning potential. And I you know I knew everyone in the industry. Like things were really really good. I just published a book. Like things were like awesome. And I was in a church service. Um, at this church called 12 Stone in Lawrenceville, Georgia. And this pastor, uh, I can't even remember his name off the top of my head. I'll, I'll hopefully I'll think of it later. But he had, he had one of the most powerful sermons ever. And the whole thing started off by him asking a question. And he says, I want some truth out of you guys. And, and if you're listening to this right now, answer these same questions in your head. And he said, who here? Raise your hand. High as can be. Who here doesn't absolutely love their job? And like the majority of the hands in the audience went up, including mine. Like who just, who is not in their absolute dream job right now? So once again, 85, 90% of the hands go up in the audience. He says, who doesn't absolutely, or who doesn't live in their absolute, like just perfect dream home right now? Like the home, if you, if there's no limitations, like that you could just paint a prettiest picture ever, raise your hand. Same thing. Almost everyone in the place went up. And then the last one, it was a little bit kind of embarrassing, but he's like, all right, don't have to raise your hand on this one, but who's not in the most perfect relationship? Maybe you're in an abusive relationship or just, just not really happy and fulfilled. And a few hands went up, uh, you know, pro- I'm guessing their spouse or a uh, significant other was not in the room with them and a little bit of laughter there. And then he got real. He's like, listen, he's like, if the vast majority of you, even just on those first two, if you're going to work eight hours a day or 10 hours or however long you're working, basically the vast majority of your waking life and you're doing something that you don't absolutely love, then quit tomorrow or quit as soon as you possibly can. He's like, no matter who you believe in, God did not put you on this earth so that you would spend the majority of your waking hours doing something that you don't absolutely love. I mean, you deserve more than that. And then he said something that I'll never forget. He's like, think of it in terms of renting versus owning. We talked about it earlier. No one likes to go backwards. We get in a comfort zone. We get all this nice stuff and we don't want to lose it. And he's like, you don't own squat. And I was like, what do you mean you don't own squat? He's like, oh yeah, I own my house. He's like, no, 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 you don't own anything. He's like, God can take it away from you tomorrow. Even if you don't believe in God, if you're an atheist, you ain't going to live forever. And at some point you are going to die. And all that stuff is now, basically it's essentially rented. You don't own it anymore. It is gone. So everything you have while you're on this earth 
is being rented to you, whether you think of it that way or not. And as soon as I started thinking of it that way, Luke and I started making the wheels turn. We started making it happen. I mean, I had young kids in, in the brand new schools. My wife had just got what she thought was her dream job. And we had, we had to reverse a lot of stuff to make it happen. And we put a goal of a year. So a lot of you might be wondering, all right, I can't quit my job tomorrow. And that's probably not the best advice. But start coming up with a plan. And and Luke and I came up with a plan. And our plan was, in one year, I was going to move because I was not happy in Lawrenceville, Georgia. Although we had some great friends there, I didn't. It wasn't our dream home. It wasn't where we wanted to be. And my wife and I both wanted to be back down in Florida. So we made a plan for one year. And guess what's ha- guess what happened? It was so cool because we got that ball rolling, and because we came up with a, an actual plan, and which we'll share with you in a little bit. I think it took like it was like seven and a half months. I think it, might, it was like just shy of eight months by time we that church service, and by time we had literally sold everything and moved all the way down to Tampa, Florida, and that was pretty awesome. And it yes, it was risky. Yes, our friends thought we were crazy. Yes. My in-laws literally thought we were crazy and were pissed off uh, that we were doing this. So, like, how could you possibly give up all the stuff that you've done and, and, you know, your status and what you're doing here? And and it came down to that that saying, like, I'm just renting it all. Like, I might as well enjoy everything that, that I have and especially, most importantly, enjoy the time that I have here on this earth. And there's a, one, a quote here. I'm going to talk about this book in a little bit. And it says... Oh, here it is. If you do it the right way, meaning you actually take chances and follow your dreams, do what Mark Twain said, you'll be you'll be saying things like, I'm glad I did, not I wish I had. And Luke and I have been living like that the past few years. Is I don't want to ever have to say I wish I had. I mean, that's a regret, and I don't want to live life with regret. So we're going to get off the, 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 the sermon pedestal here, but I feel like that was incredibly important to share with you. And if you take away anything from this podcast, because we'll talk about numbers, we'll talk about mistakes, but that biggest thing is just to appreciate your time, value your time, and if you're not 100% happy doing what you're doing today, and this even goes out to our own employees, if you're not fulfilled and doing what you're doing, then quit. Go find something else to do that you're passionate about. Live life to the fullest. Right, Lukey? That's right. Yeah, and it's, it's a risk, though. I mean, uh, we, we learned a lot of lessons, and fortunately, this, this was technically you know, our second company. So we, we had gone through the process before. On starting something from new, from from uh, you know from from nothing really, and the and, and Joe mentioned before just the, the the power of having a plan. It doesn't have to be right, and almost a hundred percent of the time it will not be right. But it's at least a plan. It's it's a it's something that you can measure yourself against, because we you know we had that plan, Joe. Right, we had that first year plan. We had yep. we had a year to figure out a way that we could actually you know get some income coming in to to support ourselves. So we fortunately had enough saved away where where we were at least comfortable with the worst case scenario where we didn't make anything for a full year. So that was that was a big that was definitely a big comfort that we had to to help us you know give the confidence to even give it a try because we had zero connections in the fishing industry. Yep. Um, really didn't know. I, I remember it was like advertising revenue was one of our top things. We knew we could get web traffic, and I remember that was like the first like the first big awakening, right? Where we had, we realized that we had like, was like 500,000 people on the website on like month four and nobody cared about it, right? Like we were calling around trying to sell some ad space. People didn't care. And uh, so that was the big, that was the big pivot. So at that point we had a plan and it involved advertising. And then we, right then we knew that we had to completely change the plan and then start a different course and then see how that goes. Yep. And I, I'm going to talk about something you said there. We, you and I were pretty fortunate because we had saved, you know, pretty well. We certainly could have been better, but we did have a little bit of a cushion. And that, that is a question that's come up a lot. Uh, you know, how much money do you really need? And at the same point, and I think you'll agree with me, I think that cushion actually hurt us a little bit. And, it made and, us get sloppy because yeah, yeah, our, our plan yeah. was very, it was very, uh, um, very high level, like there wasn't much thought into it. We, we just had a plan. Okay, we're going to make this much revenue. Like we're going to make it, but we didn't, we didn't have like a sales process behind it. It was, uh, and it, it proved to be a completely bogus plan pretty quickly because, because <laughs> we, we weren't hitting any of it. Like it was, it was awful. Like it was, 
it was definitely a big scare up front and yeah. uh, and we had multiple pivots the, and so the, let me continue on just so the, you're you know some of you might be thinking oh well gosh i don't have the one year's you know salary you know and all that stuff built in so we burned through every stinking penny at literally every single penny and then some of what we had in that nest egg every single penny before we started making any money we didn't meaning we got completely stopped sloppy we said yes to way too many things we were chasing all these things and it was not until our account and you you might know more than i but it was under ten thousand, and like we're running a real business here spending real real money un- under ten thousand we put in multiple iterations of money yes and <laughs> yeah, we so went through we're, a now, lot of money. we're now basically down to like i want to say it was seven thousand dollars and yet we had like our next credit card bill for american express was like 20 so like we were we were about to be negative for a very first time like going down in a place you don't want to be if you can avoid it and and it wasn't until then where we sat down and says we have to figure this out or, or else we is going to be broke and we're going to be going back to our old jobs <laughs> And so I tell you all that, that you don't have to have that big cushion. And, and, and in fact, I think it can actually hurt you. And I've listened to a lot of entrepreneurs, uh, you know, a lot of people on the, on the guys for like the Shark Tank and stuff. And they all say that they all pretty much started from pretty much nothing. I mean, living on couches, like just grinding away. And Luke and I took it pretty easy those first six months. And we went and lived on an island, uh, you know, and like we, we weren't really working. Even though we were working hard, we weren't really working smart. We were just kind of throwing out all kinds of stuff, saying yes to everything. And it wasn't until we actually like had guns to our head and said, we are literally not going to be able to pay our bills. And we had one employee, like we're not going to be able to pay him if we don't actually start selling something and come up with a real business plan. So I tell you all that to make sure you know you do not have to have all that stuff. It would be nice if you had a little bit. I think three months is actually pretty good. Like a three-month cushion is a, is a pretty smart idea to have, both for yourself and for your business, that if just everything collapsed, that you can at least pay your bills for two to three months. That's just smart in life. Uh, but you do not need a full year. I think, I think, if anything, that can actually hurt you. So uh, I want to talk about a, a couple like big things before we go into all these questions we had from, from everyone else. And I think this book, hopefully you can see it for people watching on YouTube, it's called The One Thing, and then Start With Why is the other book by Simon Sinek, and The One Thing is by uh, Gary Keller uh, from Keller Williams. And those two books are probably like two of the most pivotal things that I read during this process that I think change it around and here is what the start with why. Let's talk about that because that's so, so, so important. If you want to have a long-term business, if you just want to make a quick buck for like six or seven months and then keep going on the next thing over and over again, then no, start with why. Don't even waste your time reading it. If you just want to be chasing the next buck, but if you really want to have a true business, something that you can kind of step back from, not step away from, but step back from and go out, enjoy the fruits of your labor and have something you could sell, then please go read Start With Why. The entire premise is know your why. Why are you doing this? What makes you tick? Why are you getting up in the morning? Why, why are you doing this company? And for Salt Strong, I'll share it with you if you don't know what that is already. Our whole thing, and it's the one thing, thank goodness, that we actually did nail from the beginning. We didn't follow it. But it was always teaching the world how to catch more fish or teaching fishermen how to catch more fish in less time. And As time kept going on and we started getting testimonials from our fishing courses and from our insider club, we started seeing all these memories that were being made. And then we're like, you know what? Like that's, that's our business. That's our why, our, why you and I get up Luke. And I know you'll back me up on this because we talk about all the time is we're out there creating memories for people. I mean, it's, we're out there creating memories that matter. We're creating experiences for, for people. And when we get those pictures of, you know, the father that just says, hey, I just had the most amazing time with my daughter or my son. We just caught our biggest trout or a snook or even if I fell in the water, like funny stories. Like, man, we're creating memories that that kid is never going to forget as long as they, they're alive. I and mean, that's awesome. Yeah, that's what it's all about. And uh, and so that, I actually, before we got on here, I was going back to, uh, you know, my old files and I was searching for, you know, I searched for Salt Strong and I just went to like the very first thing I could find that had, 
uh, you know, when we were kind of in our in our planning phase of Salt Strong, and and I and I came up to this the the original schematic of the website. Joe, I remember going through all those uh, schematics. I think we started it in the airport um, after we decided to do it. But anyhow, uh, the the tagline was uh, sharing, uh, basically sharing the best saltwater experiences around the world. So at that point, we were all about you know kind of sharing videos, but it all it all came down to to sharing experiences and, and just helping. You know, our, the, the overall goal is just to, to help, you know, help our members have the best possible experiences out on the water with their family and friends. Yep. That's like the one thing that didn't change. We we changed business plans probably 10 times, uh, but that was like the the one thing that never did change. And, and and now that we're, you know, now that we have, you know, I think the, what is a good recipe is that now we're just completely dialed in to that exact, that exact theory. We, we, we stopped messing with the apparel and uh, really just focusing just straight on just helping, helping our members have better memories out on the water. Yep. And a lot of you have sent in messages over time and we've even got some hate mail. Oh, I can't believe you guys got out of apparel. And, and you know what? It, it was from not following our why, because although apparel actually did pay our bills for a while, I mean, we made, we made over half a million dollars in a short amount of time selling apparel, selling shirts and hats. That's a lot of money. I mean, that that's, pays a lot of freaking bills, and yet we said no to it. We literally canned it. I mean, pretty much completely, except we do give our insiders the ability to get some of our shirts and a couple hats still. But for the most part, it's just it's just a lost leader. It's just something as a thank you we give to our insiders. And But it all came down to listening to our why. We knew that us going down that path of being an apparel company did not tie into our why. Now, that does not mean if you want to start your own apparel company that you should not do it, but it better tie into your why, know your why. And so it enabled us, Luke and I, is the, the leaders and the founders of the company, to say no to every single thing that didn't tie in with the why. It's so easy, especially when you don't have a boss anymore, and you have your own company to say yes to everything, to every little shiny thing that, that looks good. And and we did that. Now, that, that really was one of the biggest mistakes is just not saying no. And now I'm finding and it makes life so much easier, right? When all of a sudden I look at my to-do list and it's like three things. It used to be like 50. I'd have this long list because we were doing so many little small stuff. And now we're like, no. Does it, does it help our audience? Does it help you, our fishermen, catch more fish in less time and create memories? If not, then no. And to us, apparel did not do that for us, meaning we, we could not figure out a way that apparel would truly help you catch more fish. You might look good out there, but it just it wasn't into our why. And we knew that if we put all of our focus in on helping you catch more fish, and that means focus on these online fishing courses, going out and teaming up with other pros like Captain C.A. Richardson, and we've got two more that are coming on here in the next 30 days, we knew that was going to help push this mission even farther. So let me read this book here and then we'll talk about something else but i really want to hammer this why thing before we get into the into the meat of this so very few people or companies can clearly articulate why they do what they do and when i say why i don't mean to make money that's a result by why i mean what is your purpose what is your cause what is your belief why does your company exist why do you get out of bed every morning and why should anybody care? That's it, right? And and you know the one thing, Luke, that we did in the beginning, you know, we because we were a little bit confused and we didn't really know our why, is you know we were posting those um, you know viral videos. And yes, it could be said that that did help get our name out there, which is probably true, but it definitely didn't tie into our why, and it actually sabotaged it because I remember meeting people that I did not know or overhearing people like explaining why they liked us. And they're like, Oh yeah, it's that viral fishing company. They do really cool viral videos. And I was like, well, that's not what we're about. That's not our why. <laughs> and they're like, well, go look at your yep. own page. It's all viral videos. I'm like, ah, they're right. Yeah. So simple. Yeah. They're yeah. exactly right. We couldn't argue with them because that, that's, that is what we were presenting to the world. And that's what they thought. And that was exactly what happened with apparel as well. Uh, thankfully yep. it helped us help us, you know, get financially sound, but everybody thought of us as, as apparel companies because that's, that's what we were displaying. And, uh, and that was, again, that was, that went away from our why, which was to help, you know, help our members catch more fish in less time. So that was literally the reason why we decided just to completely get out of it. The, the easiest way to, the, the easiest remedy for that problem 
of people, you know, even even people who are following us for a long time thought we were an apparel company. And the easiest way to solve that is to completely get away from apparel, and that's what we did. And and uh, and that was, you know, that was definitely a very risky risky decision. But I'm 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 very glad that we did it. Now everybody knows exactly what we're doing. That you know, if if you want to be part of it, great. If not, that's okay too. But uh, but at least everybody knows what we're doing. And you know what's funny? Within 30 days of us exiting the apparel industry. We had signed C. Richard, so we didn't announce it till a little bit later. But he told us that was holding him back. We've been trying to get him for a long time. Like we've loved C. C. A. But ever since we had him on our podcast, we were talking before that. That was well over a year ago, and it was because like most of these, you know, these professionals out there, the ones that had the TV shows like the C. Richardsons, they have sponsors, and they don't want to. They don't really want to risk that. Uh, and they don't want to jeopardize their sponsors who are paying them decent amount of, of money, in some cases, lots of money. Uh, and, you know, he's got Sims, for instance. And even though we weren't really a competitor of Sims, they, they target fly fishing a little bit more. It's still proof. And these next two guys, same thing. We've had private talks with them that we the two new guys will be announcing soon. Same deal. I mean, as soon as we announced we're out of apparel, it opened up all kinds of doors to do what we what we got in the business for the first place, which is teach people yep. how to fish and go out there and create amazing memories. So, so here's yep. the next one. Here's the next big big one. So I, I wanted to talk about the why, and this next one is to pick a niche, and this goes for you, Mister Bob Jones, whatever your name might be. That's going out and trying to start a company like ours. If you're starting an apparel company in the fishing world, or even if you're going to be a charter captain, the riches are made in the niches. Never forget that saying. And every time that we've gone away from this, we've kicked ourselves in the butt. Riches are made in niches. And let me give you a good example. We own Salt Strong. We own Fish Strong. It would have been really easy for us to just start with Fish Strong and just cover everything fishing in the entire world. But guess what would have happened? We wouldn't have attracted anyone because we would have not have been an expert in anything. And we just would have had a hodgepodge of stuff out there that probably confused people even more. So instead, we did the opposite. And we, we started with Salt Strong, as you know. And we only covered three fish out of the entire stinking ocean. Three fish. That's all we talked about really for the first couple of years. And a lot of people thought we were crazy. I remember my buddy Travis, who's, um, you know, kind of in the investment banking world and big construction out of New York. And he's like, oh, man, you're, just, you're missing out on all the money. I mean, all, it's all in the offshore. You know, he's used to go out in really nice offshore boats that, you know, have trips and quad engines on them and stuff. He's like, oh, man, that's where it's at. And I was like, well, that ain't our niche right now. Like, we want to own inshore fishing it really in florida and then it kind of went around the gulf and now it's going up the east coast and now here three years later we're about to team up with an offshore and kind of near shore guy going after the pelagics and you know snapper grouper etc and and another great analogy a great story of this if you've ever read about the amazon story we take it for granted today because amazon sells everything but they started out selling one product just one it books. Was books that's it and they were the world's largest online bookstore. That was their tagline. But if you read the book about the, the story of Bezos, it's a brilliant dude, by the way, as you can probably imagine. He was already trademarking the Everything Store when they were just selling books. So he had the dream. He, he had the vision. He knew what he was going to do. But he's a smart guy. He knew that the only way to really grow and expand and get where I want to be is to own a niche, to be a specialist. And then once he owned books, then he went to shoes. They actually bought Zappos. That was one of their first big purchases. And they went and did the same thing with shoes. They literally took over online shoes. And then they now, as you know, they're the everything store. And if you look at most great companies today, most of them started really small, like in a niche, selling usually just one product to one type of consumer. And so please don't forget that. And, and I'll give you an example. If you're scratching your head saying, you know, I want to be a charter captain, here's what I would do. I would, ha I would be a niche of like, this is me personally, I would only charter professional athletes. That's it. I would live, that's that's because I, I like those and I have some friends who are professional athletes and I feel like I get along with them. And guess what kind of referrals you're going to get from a, prof all you need is two good clients. If you get two good professional athletes, guess what kind of referrals you get? 
Oh, this hey, this is a charter captain that only deals with professional athletes. He's not going to make you look like an idiot. He's not going to have hidden cameras out there and make you look dumb. Like, sell all the reasons that a professional athlete would want to go with you, and that's what you're going to attract. I, I won't mention their name, Luke, but you remember there was those two people in the financial services industry. They, on their website, this is how crazy this can work. On their website, this is not something they said behind closed doors. On their actual website, publicly, they said, as financial planners, they will only work with Republican conservative married couples who have between one and three million dollars. And most people would be like, that is crazy. So you're literally going to say no to someone who's a Democrat or is not conservative, who's not maybe divorced and they have 10 million. They said, absolutely. But guess what happened? I worked with them for many, many years. Every single year, their business kept growing. Because guess what kind of referrals they got? They only got people that they were like their dream client, which was conservative Republicans who were actually married, who had between you know one and three million dollars. Sometimes it went up to five to ten. You're going to get people that are that are in and out of that range, but because they were so specific and they owned that niche in their area, like they attracted every single person that was like that. I mean, I was so brilliant, and though at some point you can actually split off and have like a side business to go after other people just like amazon did like you don't have to get stuck there for the rest of your life but you need to start there and able to grow you have to be a specialist out there especially when starting out too it's it's impossible yeah it is literally impossible to prove that you're the best at everything first of all you're not gonna be the best at everything but but just to even show that you're competent uh, that you have to start with one that's why we start with those three fish those are at least the, the fish that we we like to catch the most, and and after a few years of just continually posting about snook, redfish, and trout, we now are getting traffic um, on people who are searching for it, and and people look for tips, and not just in Florida, not just in Tampa, not just on the on the Gulf Coast. We're getting the East Coast of Florida. We're getting a lot of customers in Texas. It, it has been it has been shocking, you know how how diverse the uh, I guess the customer base has been even though we're, we're just focusing on those three fish, because those three fish cover a large range of area. And the, and the coolest thing is, although I haven't fished in Texas before, I know the strategies we use here work because a lot of our customers are over there and the same exact strategies and tactics are working for, for those fish. So it's been really cool to see that, you know, even in fishing, right, there uh, are species that lives in Florida or even different regions around Florida, they're, they're almost always going to be behaving the same way. So that you actually can, you know, you, you can a- apply the, the same stuff across different, uh, different areas. It's been pretty cool. Yeah. I mean, what's, what's funny, Luke, I, th- I think now we have at least one, if not many customers in every single state, even though like our tips are primarily from Texas, you know, past Florida, all the way up in the, in the North Carolina region. And yet we have people in every single state, some that have second homes, some that just come down once or twice a year and just want to maximize their time. But that, that is proof that if you just kind of own a niche and just become an expert at something, you will start attracting all kinds of people. And, and back to the whole, if you want to be a charter captain, an inshore fishing guide, offshore fishing guide, I mentioned like going after a certain person, like a celebrity or, you know, a certain athlete, sports players, but you can also just go after one fish, like be the expert for tarpon, be the expert for catching, you know, bonefish. I mean, there's, there's an expert out there somewhere who is like the go-to guy to go catch catfish. You know, I mean, right there, there's an expert in, out there for everything. And I guarantee they have a much easier time attracting customers and getting referrals because they're the go-to guy. But if you start off right away and you want to start doing, oh, I'll do inshore, offshore, I'll go anywhere the fish are biting, you ain't going to attract anyone, and you're going to end up probably pretty frustrated. But if you say, you know what, I am the number one guy in Tampa Bay for catching redfish or bull, like a certain type of redfish, like the really big, overblown, fat redfish, you're going to start attracting people that want to catch that. So please, please, please remember, riches are made in the niches. So we're going to go through... No, man, I think we I think we hit that one pretty hard. Do you want to go through some of the questions? A lot of questions came in. Yeah, let's do it. So I'm going to start at the top of mine. Um, we kind of hit a little bit of these. Uh, how to find the courage and family support to take the leap of faith. Uh, we mentioned earlier, there's just never a perfect time. Um, but let me, I'm going to keep pulling this little book out here. For those of you on YouTube, you can see it. 
the start with why, I mean, definitely read that. If you're going to read any book, read start with why, even on Audible, and identify the why. And if, if you can't convince your spouse based on your why that this is a good idea and you can actually change your world and, and, and you be happier, which is really what life should all be about, then you might have a bad business idea. So, I mean, really start with that why. And with my wife, she knew because she knew what an impact it had on my life. And, you know, and it was all because of our grandfather getting my dad and getting us into fishing. And she knew that I wanted to create that for as many people as possible. And, and once again, I, I, we can't go on forever on that, but there's never a perfect, a perfect time. Uh, but I would try to convince your wife and some of your close yeah. friends first. But at the same point, don't listen to every single thing they say, because there are a lot of friends and even family members that will be jealous of you. We've had them. You are going to have them. You're going to have even close friends that are in a miserable job, a dead-end job that they hate. Maybe not a dead-end job, just a job they're not fulfilled by. And they will be jealous seeing you go leave to pursue something that you love doing. I know that sounds hard to believe, but I promise you it will happen at least once, if not dozens of times with people that you know. It's just life, unfortunately. Yeah, and, and it all goes back to having a good plan too, right? If you have a good business plan together, that's going to be it's going to be eat a lot easier to to get you know your spouse and family behind you. Um, you know, we we just had a lot of energy with the with the kind of a crummy business plan, but so we got we got the support we needed. But anyhow, having a good a well thought out business plan will help everything. Because next question is is how much money do I need to get started and what's required and and uh, and the, as Joe said earlier, there's there's not a specific amount. You know, ideally have at least a few months savings. Um, you know, we had more, but we kind of squandered it. It might have been uh, um, kind of a, a detrimental because because we were able to be a little bit less uh, less diligent on on making sure that we were spending money the right way. Like we we rented that house out for a month, like in, in month number three. Um, uh, so we we just we blew a lot of money that first year. Um, but again, you know, we, we could, but the good, or the most important thing is have a business plan and just have all your numbers ready to go where you know exactly how long you can, uh, you can, you can survive. Yeah. And the best way to do that, cause this is a question that came up a lot it, and this is going to be the same regardless of what kind of job or company you're starting is talk to other people who have done it before. You'll be surprised. There'll be some helpful people, especially some of the older people that have kind of been there, done that. If like you're want to be a charter captain, there's guys that will tell you, here's exactly how much it's going to cost you per month to have this size boat. So if you're going to do that and you need, you know, real physical assets, do that first, like get an Excel spreadsheet and say, all right, this, you know, 32 foot boat or 21 foot boat, whatever you might be doing is going to cost me this much per month, this much insurance, make sure you get insurance. That's a question that came up a lot. Get a a liability umbrella for sure, regardless of what business you're doing. That's it's a no-brainer. I think I've got like a couple million dollar liability umbrella just for all the random stuff that happens outside of our business with me. And I mean, it's a couple hundred dollars a year, not a month, like a year. It's it's a no-brainer. But first and foremost, write all that stuff down and like don't don't like go down to the p uh, down to the, the 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 final decimal like always raise it up a little bit. Don't be super conservative. Like give yourself a little bit of a buffer because things are going to happen, but you need to know about the cost of, you know, the boat. And, you know, if you're going to store it somewhere, which you'll have to, obviously, uh, you need to know that you need the cost of the gas, the insurance, and all the other stuff that comes with it, all your equipment, uh, make sure you have all that. And then on the other side of it, this is the other critical part. A lot of people leave off is how much is it going to cost you to acquire a customer? You know, there's so many people, and let's just take fishing guides, for for example, since we're on that topic, that, you know, they can go get a handful or a dozen friends, family, maybe old coworkers to give them some business. And then all of a sudden, they're kind of scratching their, their butt saying, all right, well, what do I do? I don't really have a website. I don't really know how to market yet. How do I get more customers? Like the referrals aren't coming as quick as I wanted. So that other part is you have to know either how to market or how to pay someone else to market to help you acquire customers. And there, I don't, I don't know all the sites that are out there because they, they seem to be, you know, some of them going by the wind. But you know, there's some of these sites that can basically help you book, uh, you know, spots on your boat or entire full, full trips. 
yet, of course, they want a piece of it or you have to pay a monthly fee. So factor all that stuff in because not every single book you get is going to be a full six or eight hour where you get paid eight hundred, nine hundred dollars or a thousand if you're if you're good and you get a good tip, etc. So make sure to factor all that stuff in. But that most important piece, in my opinion, is Luke said, have the plan, know what your costs are, and then know how much it's going to cost you, at least a general idea, to acquire that customer. That's the only way that you can scale. And that brings me into a question uh, Robert here asked. And that question before, by the way, was uh, Dixon Allen and Jared Martin. Thank you. was the one prior. Or, or Keith Wolf was the, uh, the one before that. So Robert asked like some of the 10 most common mistakes. I think one of the biggest mistakes that we made and that pretty much everyone makes today is focusing on too much on social media and getting Facebook likes and Instagram followers. There is to me, there's nothing worse that you can do with your time. Cause, and I know because we spent so much time, like that was one of our main metrics. How stupid is that looking back? Like literally that was what we were tracking. Oh no, we're up to like 2000 Facebook likes. I remember we were celebrating, I think it was in March. So it took us three months. We got 9,000 Facebook likes and we thought we were like the cat's meow yet. We weren't making any money. I was like, how stupid is that? Yep. We're literally yeah, celebrating we were tracking, the wrong thing. Yeah, we, we were talking about yeah the number of uh, sessions we had on our website and then yeah the Facebook likes the you know the YouTube followers that that was our focus early on and that was that was the big mistake as soon, as soon as we got away from those metrics we did much much better and so if you're sitting there wondering all right Joe Luke what should I focus on focus on the business focus on your why like and what you're going to sell to these people what value are you creating what need are you filling in the marketplace that's really what it comes down to right is finding out your why and then finding out the need that you can fill in the marketplace and facebook likes ain't helping anybody and, and you know, recently <laughs> facebook just made a big change zuckerberg just came out recently and just flat out said that if you're a business and you have a Facebook account, your stuff is going to be shown to about 1.5 to 2% of your followers. Ugh. We, we were all mad when it was like at 16%. Now it's going to be down to like 2% or less, and that's probably just going to keep dropping and dropping. So, you know, if you have a million Facebook followers, only 2% of those people are ever even going to see your stuff. It's not worthless, but there's not that much value there. And here's a good example. If Facebook canned our entire Facebook page like our salt strong page tomorrow it would not change us one bit it would literally not change our numbers at all we might not be happy about it, about it and we would probably fight <laughs> to get it back but it really would not change our numbers now on the other hand if they took our group which we'll talk about a little bit later about the power of building a community around your product or service or company i'd be pretty pissed about that and that would actually sting but if you're ever like held hostage or hold holding to just one like social media platform. That's if that's like where most of your revenue is coming from, then you're in trouble. And, and Dan Kennedy, a guy that, that we listen to a lot of kind of an old school marketing guru. He says that all the time, like don't ever be susceptible to just one thing. Meaning if all your business is and all of your followers and like your entire entity is on Instagram or YouTube or Facebook, I mean, you're screwed if they decide to make a massive change like they just did, and like YouTube did recently, and hurt a lot but of YouTube, YouTubers. Yeah, YouTube Red's coming out now. Yeah, that's gonna that's gonna impact a lot of the YouTubers. Right. Now, now we're not saying don't be on those platforms. I think you would also be crazy to not be on the platforms. But don't put all your time and energy and money like don't be going out and doing Facebook like campaigns. And we did that. I remember for a while, and we did a very long thing because I, we finally like we're like, wait a minute, how are we supposed to monetize this? <laughs> but we were paying, you know, like 80 cents, let's just say a Facebook like. How dumb is that? And now, knowing what we know now in terms of like building an actual marketing plan and like funnels, now we can get a new lead in many cases for 80 cents. Like we can actually get someone not just to like our page, but to give us their information and have a relationship with them, actually start emailing with them, and then hopefully get them to either join our Insider Fishing Club or invest in one of our online courses. I mean, that's night and day difference versus someone who just likes your page and might even be a bot for all we know and is most likely not going to be part of the 2% that even sees our stuff going forward. So please focus on the stuff that matters. And here's kind of my next big tip. In those first 30 days, 60 days, especially if you have a really small budget and you have a spouse, 
who's on your butt to say, how are we going to pay the bills? Go out and create customers as quick as possible. That's all you should be concerned about. Nobody cares about your stinking logo. No one cared about our logo. We cared about it. No one cares about business cards. We still don't have business cards. I think actually we just got business cards for Tony and Will it, now in year three. We, get, we, we got ours. We got those metal ones just for iCast. Well, that, yeah, that was, those were kind of, that was more of a, uh, that was, I don't that, call those business cards. That, that was that was part of us wasting that first round of money. Yeah, <laughs> so that's was exactly what that was. But no one really cares <laughs> so much about the website, like, and I know that sounds really harsh and really tough, but you ain't gonna have a business and all that stuff like your logo and like your color schemes and all that stuff and your business cards. It's all gonna be gone if you don't get out and sell something. So you got to get out and sell something. You have to find a need too because. Just because you have a why, I mentioned earlier, and this is a really important part, you still need to make sure it fulfills some kind of need out in that marketplace. We saw a need that there wasn't that much really good fishing education out there, that a lot of it was just filled with ads and sponsors and stuff, and that's fine. You know, There's plenty of companies that can do that and get away with it, but we're one of the few companies and kind of our unique selling proposition, that's another word that you need to know, unique selling proposition, the thing that makes you different is we're helping fishermen catch more fish and we don't have sponsors. We're not you know, saying, oh, you have to use this lure, or this rod and reel or this boat. We're literally telling you like it is, here's what works, here's why, and here's why you should get this or here's why you should avoid that. So uh, very, very, very critical to, uh, to grow in this thing is – is knowing your USP, knowing your why, and fulfilling some type of need out there. Yeah, so the the only quote I'll mention on here, Joe's covered enough of them, but uh, but it's from old uh, Zig Ziglar, and uh, and it's really you know a quote that that really helped helped me, you know, who's very conservative, you know, push through and continue forward, even though we were losing all of our savings so fast. But but the the saying is you know if you, if you help enough people get what they want you can get what you want and so we knew just from hearing you know those testimonials early on about you know on those original fishing tips that, like the original course and in the start of our membership we we just heard you know how how big of an impact it was making on, on so many members' lives where they they now just, just even if it's just simply just as simple as having the confidence to go out and be confident they're going to catch some fish, be confident that they're not going to do anything stupid. They're not going to, going to look like a, you know, look like a, a total rookie in front of, you know, a friend or, or even at the dock or pier, you know, we were making a difference. They were, they were, they were catching their first fish or their biggest fish or helping their kids catch their first fish. And, and so that's when I realized, okay, like we, we, we are, you know, we, we actually have tapped into something. And so now it's just a matter of just, just helping as many people, get to that as possible is, is our goal. Yep. So let's, let's stay on that. So I mentioned earlier about going out and selling something like getting some customers as quick as humanly possible. We talked about filling, you know, filling the need and Luke's talking about scaling it. And here's the way to scale it. Just get 10, focus on getting your first 10 customers. Cause one's too small. You don't need a hundred, but 10. And then like literally get on the phone, reach out to them and ask them like ask them how they found you. That's that's a question we ask everyone. How'd you find us? Like, if if everyone started saying YouTube, then guess what? We probably need to do more YouTube videos. If everyone started saying referrals, like word of mouth, if you're a fishing guy, they're like, oh well, so and so Bob from this company. Well, man, maybe I should reach out to that company and cut a deal with them. Like they're referring half my business. So listen to the people, your customers are probably the biggest goldmine of just information. And usually they'll be honest and tell you what they like about you, what they don't like. They, we hear that as well. And that's how we fix things and improve. And they'll also tell you what they want next, especially if you ask them. And that has been critical for us. And that's why I mentioned earlier that it would sting if we lost that Facebook group. Because, you know, that is a place that we just openly communicate and we talk about some things like this, like our issues and where we've screwed up. I've had, I think, two open apology letters over the last three years of just talking about things that we screwed up after hearing from you. And we've also like had some record months because we listened to you and people said, here's what I want next. Here's how you can help improve my life. And when someone tells you that, go make it for them, go build it for them, and they're most likely to buy it from you. So just in the, that first 30 to 60, 90 days, so critical to, to come up with the product whether or service, whether you be taking someone out or you're actually selling a piece of apparel, an online fishing course like us, 
get some people through it. Even if you have to give it at cost or even lose money in the beginning, we lost yeah, money. We lost yeah, money in the beginning for both apparel and for our online fishing courses. We literally were losing money just to get people through to get feedback from them. So you got to get feedback in those first thirty days, and then and only then can you make it better and start scaling that sucker. So 10, 10, 10 new customers if you're a newbie as quick as possible and then literally get on the phone, like call them, meet with them, uh, do anything you can to just like get as much candid unbiased feedback from them that they will tell you a lot. Yeah. Negative, negative feedback is just as important, if not more important than the positive stuff too. Obviously it doesn't, doesn't help the confidence out, but, but just hearing, hearing what you're doing wrong is great because Hey, just fix that, right? It's, uh, if it's wrong, they're, they're not happy. They're not happy with it. And it's all about listening to all feedback, whether it's good or bad, especially the bad, and then making making changes whenever needed. It's uh, you know that was one thing that you know uh, starting something new, you just have to be adaptable because you're going to hear a ton of feedback, filter through it all, listen to every single one of them, and then make the changes when needed. Yep. So Nancy Lopez says, can you give advice on time management and how to avoid the time sucks that won't add to the bottom line? It's an awesome question. And I, I think for me, it comes down to this book. There's one YouTube can see it. The one thing I mentioned earlier, I mean, those two books, the start with why and the one thing were so critical. You know, the one thing, the question is, and this is something that you should ask yourself every single morning when you wake up. Literally, I ask myself every day, at least the days that are super productive, and on a, and on, in a given quarter, you should ask this, and even on a given calendar year, your whole team should kind of know, like, what's the one thing? And it all boils down to what's the one thing that I can do right now or this year, whatever time frame, that makes everything else just super easy or even unnecessary? So you know, what's that one thing that I could be doing today that makes all that other little stuff like really easy or completely just go away and unnecessary? And once you can identify that, it's going to be different for everyone. But once you can identify that, it is a game changer. And you, you don't get so worried about all the time suck stuff because if you can just account, like for me, I try to have like one big thing per day. You know, today, Luke, you know what it was? It was about redoing part of our insider fishing club, about just the indoctrination process to make sure people know exactly all the stuff they get. It's going to take me a full day. And I know once that's knocked out, I'm like, man, all that other stuff is so much easier. Because all these other little things were kind of tied into it. I was like, man, that's like the one thing that knocks out all the little small stuff. Yep, very important. And yeah, and, and as far as time management for me, I, I just went through and I, I just, you know, I never did watch that much TV, but I, I would catch myself just like having lunch or something and and just watching, you know, watching the TV show. And so I, I basically just got rid of all the distractions just so that I wouldn't have to worry. But I literally cut the cable, I, I turned the TV off, and I literally did not watch the TV at all. And, uh, and, and so for me, that, that just helped me just make sure that even if, I, uh, even if my mind started wandering, eh, what's, you know, what's on this TV show or what's on, and I, I, I couldn't turn it on. So, uh, so it's, uh, you know, be, be mindful, but also just, just cut the distractions. Just, just the ones that you can, can get by without just get rid of them. It's, yeah, and uh, just not worth it. And attack, attack the biggest thing first. Like attack that tough thing first. There's other people that will say to the opposite, like get all the small stuff. But no, once you knock that big thing out, everything else is a whole lot easier. And actually, it just it goes by a million times faster if you can just face like your biggest fear, the one thing that you know is going to be the biggest needle mover. Once that is done, it's a game changer. And here's another book. Uh, the 80 20 principle. You don't even have to read this sucker. I'll just tell you. It's 80 20. If you haven't heard of that rule, the Preto, Preto's law, it's that, you know, 80% of your revenue and everything that you do basically is boils down to, to usually 20, meaning, you know, 80% of our revenue comes from 20% of our customers. And 80% of all the momentum we're building is from like 20% of the stuff we're doing on a day to day basis. So knowing that, and it's usually that one big thing is usually causing like 80% of the next big ripple that's going to get us, you know, to where we need to go next. So when you can focus on that and identify that, it's game changing. And, and let's just take the apparel, for instance. We noticed yeah. that, you know, one shirt was like almost 80% of our sales. So like, man, we just got to focus on that and like sell more of that thing. Same with, you know, our courses and our insider membership. We noticed that the majority of people that were becoming an insider member or insider fishing club, they were like seeing the most improvement. 
and this is something we say over and over again, which I'll have it memorized in my head. They see the most improvement. They become more consistent and they have the most fun. Like that's where we get the most testimonials. They're like, you know what? We should probably grow that sucker. And now looking at our stats today, it's, you know, it's quickly becoming 80% of, of our business. So yeah, and that's where, that's where a lot of referrals come from too. You got a lot of, a, a lot of the insiders are from just hearing about, you know, friends of friends telling friends. It's been, it's been something that it's just, you know, we just keep adding value to it and it's just growing organically, which has been awesome. Yep. Um, Corinne Fuller says, how to find your niche, how to find companies to partner with, you know, where to start, what, at the end of the day, you realize you're made for more of a worker bee role, but have ideas and real value to bring to the table and want to find companies who allow you to work for them and to create intent. That's a, that's an awesome question. And yeah, not everyone is meant to be an entrepreneur by any stretch of the imagination. However, I think that everyone does deserve, as I mentioned earlier, to go find something that keeps them happy and fulfilled. And whether that means you're starting with a small company, which kind of means you're an entrepreneur, even though you might not be the founder, is kind of what I'm hearing you say, Corinne, uh, that still means you're essentially an entrepreneur. If you're with a startup or a small group, or even if you're not, you can add tremendous value to uh, to those groups. Um, how do you find your niche? I, I can't really answer that. That's going to come down to your why. You know what what makes you tick? Why do you you know why do you get up? Um, in the morning. Now, the companies to partner with, that's an interesting one because who else mentioned that? Um, oh, it doesn't matter. I'll, I'll find it. Um, I think Danny. Danny mentioned that as well. Yeah, it was, it was another one. But anyhow, he mentioned about just how networking can be critical. And, and I agree with that to an extent. Uh, no one's going to do the work for you. So you still have to get there and do all the work and come up with a plan and make things happen and actually sell stuff. And I, I think for most people, even people who were like born to be entrepreneurs, even though that's not possible, but just people that you visualize that are that are just salespeople, maybe kind of like myself, one of the scariest things to do is to get out and sell. And And I did that for a long time. Like when we first started, I think Luke and I were both – you know, just a little bit timid to go out and sell the stuff, you know, and some of it was from confidence. Some of it was just, it's not, it's not fun sometimes to go out there and sell stuff. So I I think that's the biggest hurdle most people have to get through is to go out there and sell, find something that you're passionate about, that you believe in, which once again ties into your why. And once you have that, it makes it a whole lot easier to, to sell it. Now, and that might have been part of the problem. In the beginning, we were selling apparel, and at one point we were trying to sell ad space, and we just weren't that passionate about it. And in return, we didn't really sell it that much. I think we were a little bit timid about it. But I think if you can find something you love and 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 figure out what makes people tick, like why they really need your service. Like for us, if you're someone – who is frustrated and maybe you have just really inconsistent days where, you know, one day you're out catching so many fish, you're like considering entering a tournament. And then the very next trip you get skunked and like, you literally can't buy a strike. Then you're a fit for our insider club. And so knowing that that's something that we harp on all the time, because we know that's one of the main problems. Most of our best clients are having. And that's the one thing that we want to help them improve because we know if we get out, they get out there and they're able to find fish quicker that they're going to have more experiences, better experiences. They're going to have more memories. They're going to be able to pass that stuff on to their kids and their loved ones, et cetera. So great question on that. One other thing in terms of partnering, I wrote this, I wrote this down last night. Another great idea is to team up with businesses. And this is regardless if you have a company like us, we're starting to do this right now, FYI. And or if you're in a company like an apparel company who wants to go supply a certain business with that apparel because they all want to have matching uniforms, whatever it might be, or matching fishing team shirts, or if you're a fishing guide, businesses, especially big ones, they have a lot of money, they waste a lot of money, and yet they want to do exciting, fun things for their employees. And I worked at, I would say, a somewhat small company my first 10 years of, of my career. And I, I mean, I remember we would, and we were a small company, we would spend, you know, $250,000 on our Christmas party. That's a lot of cash down the tubes. We, we would take trips like with the company wide. And I think the budget was like 900 and like 80, it was almost a million dollars, $980,000 just so they could create a cool experience for us. And I tie this in because one of the trips we took was actually to Hawaii and I, it was either the, I think it was the Four Seasons Resort. It was a, one of those really nice resorts. Uh, I think it was the Four Seasons in Hawaii. And we had a choice. 
that day to either go golfing or to go offshore fishing. I, of course, went offshore fishing. And I ended up, you know, talking to the, to the captain of the boat for a while. And this dude has the best setup ever. So he only, he literally, like, parks his boat at the Four Seasons dock. That's where he gets to slip. And all day long, he doesn't have to go, he does not have to go out and find customers. They're literally coming to him. He has customers every single day, 365 days a year, coming to him where he just wakes up and he knows his boat is going to be filled with high-paying business customers. So literally every customer is a business that's coming into the Four Seasons and they're offering something cool to their employees. So think about that. How can that apply to your business? Even if, Corinne, someone like you, even if you're not going to go out and start your own company, how can you help your company do something like that? There are so many companies that are doing cool experiences and taking vacations and stuff with their employees that are looking for cool things. And you could be the fishing guide that only works with ABC Corporation. And that's where all your referrals come from. And you know, these companies are also, they're looking for their, especially their top executive people, they're looking for them to go out and have experiences, looking for them to get out every once in a while and go, go take their top customers out. So think about if you could be the guy, let me think of a big, uh, a big company. Um, let's just say like Bank of America or SunTrust in Florida, where you're the go-to guy for like Bank of America or SunTrust execs to come on and close deals in your boat. And you're like, just, I'll lay out the red carpet. I'll even pay for the limo. That means you could charge more money and create like the most amazing experience so they can drink beer, have a good time and catch a couple of fish. I'm telling you, like, that's the kind of stuff that ties back into the niches, but also ties in using, you know, companies and using other assets like that. Uh, so I think it's a great question. And I think everyone's crazy not to do that because there's so many companies and big businesses are looking to team up with people like you that can create cool experiences for either their employees or their own customers. Right, Lukey? Absolutely right. And that, that kind of goes into, uh, I'm trying to look at this list of questions. Someone is basically asking, you know, where, where to get customers from. And, and just like that, there's really no perfect answer. That, that is a way, a great way to get a lot of customers and a steady stream of customers. But as far as we, where the next customer is coming from, it's all about, you know, having your why and then knowing who you serve. And then once you know that, then, okay, where do those people spend a lot of their time? Right. It could be on Facebook. It could be on YouTube. It could be at a business, you know, like a networking event or, or whatever the case is at a, at a hotel that Joe was mentioning. Um, so there's no, there's never a one a, a one size fits all. You know, we, we try to make sure to have a, a lot of different streams of, uh, of getting new customers. We don't just focus just on Facebook or just on YouTube, just on our blog. We do we do a little bit of everything. And, and the truth is, you know, we get a, a basically a, a steady flow from all these different all those different funnels. And uh, so long story short, there's no, there's never, it all depends on, on who your ideal customer is and where they spend the most time. Yep. And I would add on to that. I think Vincent was uh, who asked that looking down here at the, at least one of the questions on that, yep. you know, we mentioned talk to those 10 first, you know, those 10 first customers, find out where they hang out, like ask them, Hey, what kind of magazines do you read? Like you know, what kind of forums are you on? Where do you go on online? What are your favorite sites? To Luke's point, find out where they are. And then, and I think this is critical, and we're kind of saving it a little bit towards last, you have to learn how to advertise a little bit if you really want to scale a company. And for some of you, it could be viral videos. I mean, some of these YouTubers that are like, they're not really doing advertising, like they're not spending ad dollars, I don't think, but they're really good at just getting stuff out there. That's a really, really specific, like, gift they have like we can't do that it's really tough for us to do that so we have to learn how to advertise and most likely you will too and that means to create a, a, a funnel and a process where you're able to get someone whether it be you know going on radio and and being a charter captain like john gunner uh he's the the guy who wrote fishing in our soul you know he's on 97 country in uh in polk county there and he gets a lot of clients from that so every friday he goes on the 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 air and just gives a fishing report and Guess what? It turns out that pretty much every radio station in America is looking for stuff like that. You know, even if it's just once a week or once a month, reach out to places like that. And that's how he got that gig. And he reached out to him and said, hey, I'll be glad to give you a fishing report every every Friday morning. And he gets a lot of customers uh, from that. So once again, that's his form of advertising. But I think to really scale or grow, you need to either you know learn how to do Facebook marketing or Google AdWords, something where you can put a dollar in 
and get a certain you know return back in a certain amount of time and that's all going to depend on your business some are going to have a little bit longer you know lag time in terms of getting that money back some could be really quick like in the first five to 14 days but i think that's really the only way to scale you know a, a company uh, and it's what, like, look at, you know, Huck Fishing, right? That was kind of our competitor when we were calling ourselves an apparel company. And, I mean, they got them. And those guys know how to market. If you're on Facebook or YouTube or Instagram or pretty much any site on the Internet, you see Huck Fishing stuff. I mean, they're really good at doing those ads. And not to say you have to compete against them or, like, outsmart them, but that's, to me, you almost, you, that's really the only way to really grow and scale a business. Do you agree, Luki? Yeah, and then – Absolutely. Yeah. And Vincent's, Vincent's question was about growing the audience. He's, he's doing, he started a YouTube channel and recently, and that's, uh, that's all about telling a good story. If, if the focus is on, on, on a YouTube channel, which is, which is okay, a lot of people are doing great with that. It's about telling a good and unique story every single video. And, and obviously knowing, you know, knowing who your target is, you know, know your, the age bracket you're going towards and, and then talking directly to them, making the video directly for them. Because if you're making, if you're trying to make it for everybody, it's not going to directly appeal to anybody. It's not going to be one that they are like dying to share with their friends. So, so anyhow, yeah, it's all about decide exactly who you want to appeal to, and then make your videos, tell a good story, and make it specific to who you want, you know, who you want to share your videos. Yeah, a lot of you know these books, and I'll put them in the in the show notes. A lot of these books, you know, they mention a thing called your your avatar client you know your ideal customer and you do want to identify that and it goes back to that niche that you created remember that the people i told you in the financial services their avatar client was someone who is married who is super conservative and had between two and five million or uh, uh, one to three million dollars that's it like that's their avatar client so every time that they do a video vincent or every time that they do a facebook post or every time they send an email out you almost want to imagine yourself talking to that person we do that we have a person I literally have a picture of them right over here to my left i won't show you because it's our <laughs> private information but i literally have a picture of this guy holding a big redfish and he's my avatar client he's the guy i'm literally talking to every time i write something and a lot of you might be saying, man, I feel like Joe or Luke was talking to me. I know because I get a lot of your emails back, you know, saying, you know, man, that was awesome. I feel like you're talking to me. And it's because we are trying to talk to our avatar ideal customer. And I think if you try to just talk too broadly, you're Luke's point earlier, you're just not going to attract too many people. And, but I, I do want to mention this, Vince, because a lot of other people had mentioned, you know, how to um, how to monetize like your social media stuff. To me, that's not a long-term business play um, for most people. There are some people who are making a living doing it, but it's super tough. Every time one of these big platforms makes a change like YouTube did in the past few months and like Facebook did in just the past two weeks, it can literally take your income in half or sometimes eliminate it if they decide to shut down your account. So I would be really scared personally to build any kind of business that's 100% reliant on someone else's platform like YouTube or Facebook, et cetera. That does not mean you should not be on there. You should 100% be on there. You should even grow a business off of it, but don't let that be your entire business model for life. You still got to be able to sell something. You still got to be able to way to have a way to, to contact your customers. Like if you look at all those YouTubers, every one of them now is starting to sell stuff. They're getting smart because they're realizing, man, YouTube just literally killed my income, like overnight, YouTube killed these YouTubers income. Now they're all starting to get in apparel. They're selling products They're teaming up with other big brands to sell their products. It's a smart play. It's what they should have done. I'm glad they're doing it. And that's what you should do too. always have to have something in the back of your mind that you can sell, not just to sell something but that truly adds value to your avatar client. That has to be part of it because otherwise you're just going to be ticking off people by, by pushing stuff they don't want. So it's got to be something that, that fits or fills a need and that also fits and ties into your avatar client. That's a great, great question because that's something that something we all struggle with, right? And that's, I think that's the way that you can go down a lot of wrong paths. And it just comes back to creating those 10 customers, asking them what they liked about you, what they dislike about you, and what they want more of, and then creating it for them, and then just going and getting 10 more. Um, I don't remember what book it was. I'm looking at a couple of them here, but uh, I think it was one of Tim Ferriss's books in his interview that the guy said, all you need is a 1,000 like really avid 
like hardcore customers and you've got a million dollar, if not multi-million dollar business, that's it. If you have like a thousand rabid fans, that's all it really takes. And those are people that usually like with us that you've kind of transformed their life or you've made their life better. You've improved their status or you've you know created a cool memory for them. All you need is a thousand. You got something pretty special. And, um, hopefully, uh, hopefully that helps. What else Luke? What other uh, questions? Another one from uh, Bradley LZ um, about just, you know, best way to network with people in the, in, in the industry. And uh, I'll, I'll say for fishing, you know, you know, there's everywhere, right? Any, anytime you're out fishing, it's uh, it's crazy. Just even chatting with people at the, at the docks and the boat ramps is one thing, but as far as like the big industry thing, you know, that's, uh, that's ICAST. I, I think that's one of we kind of have met a lot of the, uh, you know, the, the bigger the bigger players is is through our our few times going to iCast, but uh, but again the cool thing you can do it anywhere it doesn't have to be at a formal event. Uh, I would say just anytime you're on the water, just never be never be shy, be friendly to everybody, and then uh, start a conversation. You never know who you're going to meet next. Yeah, so 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 true. Um, another one I wrote down was because someone mentioned it is always have a backup plan, and I completely disagree with that. And most of the books, like Think and Grow Rich, you know, one of the, the most famous, like, personal development, making money books out there, it says burn every ship behind you. And that's what we did. I mean, we literally sold our stuff. I moved my family from Georgia to, to down to Florida. Uh, you know, my wife had to quit her job. I had to quit my job, like, sell everything. Uh, I wasn't going back. There's no going back. And I, I think if you have – plan B in the back of your head. And it's not to say that you can't have some plan way back there, like you could fall back on. But if you, if you have a true backup plan that you could just jump to at any given day and time, it's probably not going to work that well. Um, now it's not to say that you can't start a company while you have another one. Like you can't sort of as a shot side job just to make sure you can get those first 10 customers. Cause if you can't get the first 10 customers then yeah, you probably maybe should start something else. Definitely not saying you have to like burn every bridge right away, but if you ever really want it to grow, if you want it to be really like a fulfilling business where you're actually seeing this, you know, puppy come alive and it's something you could sell down the road, you're going to have to burn every bridge behind you. It's the only way you're going to take it serious. It's the only way you're going to be able to give all your time and love and attention that comes in to growing, you know, a business from, uh, from scratch. So I say when the time is ready and that means either you have, ample supplies and you're ready to go to war uh or if you actually have like something that's actually selling you're like all right we can make this happen then burn every stinking bridge behind you and go for it like pound the pavement leave it all on the field if you will otherwise uh, i think as i mentioned in my quote earlier life's uh, life's too short to you just kind of have a foot in each side agree with that luke cool that's that's uh yeah i totally agree and uh yeah i mean just having you know having the like basically Basically, our, our years worth of, uh, of money when we started the business was kind of our plan B, right? Like, we really didn't get serious until we got there toward the end of it. And if we just had six months of money, we probably would have gotten serious on month six versus month, uh, month 11. Yeah. We would have saved a lot of, a lot of uh, wasted money. But uh, do one more question. I've got uh, – my phone's about to die here. So uh, we'll do one on uh, Danny. Uh, Danny Trevino had a good question. Um, talked about, you know, uh, you know, trust, respect, loyalty is huge for him. And, and obviously when you're starting a company, as it grows, you, you, you have to bring on new people or, or team up with different companies. And so he was basically like, you know, how often do you take the leaps of faith with other people, right? Like, uh, fortunately, Joe and I are brothers, so we know we, we have each other's back, but, you know, bringing on other people, you know, how often does it happen? And, and, uh, he asked, you know, how, how has it worked out for you? And, and how often you do it. And as far as how often it's kind of whatever needed, right? If there's something that we need that we can't do ourselves, then we just have to, we have to, you know, find somebody who can do it and ideally, you know, do it better than we can. And, um, in the trust thing, you know, I'm big about trust as well. And, and that's just one thing you don't know after like an interview. Um, so it's almost, you kind of have to go with your gut and then, and then again, have a defined plan for whoever you bring on board, have exactly, you know, have a, um, almost a contract on exactly what they're going to do and by when, and then evaluate. You know, it's, it's either working or it's not. If it's working, fantastic. If it's not, then then it's very evident that you know that that defined plan wasn't met. 
and then you just you know split paths. Yeah, two two books. I'm going to end on these. One is called Traction, and Traction is I think probably if I was going to pick any book besides the why that you have to read that. But Traction it really covers everything you need to know about you know defining why your company exists, um, uh, your you know your uh, uh, all your core benefits and like how you're actually going to help people. It's where you define like your avatar or client. It's all basically all the stuff that we talked about, but then it gets into the whole hiring process and why you never want to hire too early. You, you never want to hire too late, but if you're going to pick a side, you hire too late, not too early. Cause it's too early. I mean, it can, it can really, really hurt you if you don't have the funds there. And that ties in to book number two, which is called profit first. And this is really just meant for entrepreneurs, like first time business starters uh, about transforming your business from a cash eating monster to a money making machine. And it's all about getting profitable first and then finding out what you're best at, like your one thing that you that you're better than everyone else in your team and then going finding other people who are best at the other stuff like I'm not good at the accounting stuff. I like a lot of people I just hate accounting. It's not my strong suit. So, you know, that's one of the next hires that we're going to be making is like someone who's kind of like an accountant slash COO uh, FYI, in case you're interested, uh, let us know. Uh, but that's going to be one of our next big hires because we're looking at it our day, meaning Luke and our, like how much time we're spending on these numbers and stuff that we honestly just hate doing. We have enough income now and some profits that we can go get that person. And now it makes sense for us. But in the beginning, you're going to most likely be bootstrapped like we were. Don't go higher too early. I think, I think it's actually this book traction that talks about something that we've been doing now recently, and it's called a 90 day plan. So when you hire someone, it should just be on a 90 day trial. And if they don't like it, Tell them to go look somewhere else. You're not obviously not a fit because if they're buying into you, they will do it. Meaning if, if they're buying into your why and there's passion about you, about what you're doing, they will gladly do it. Like, you know, the, the gentleman we got recently, Luke, on our analytics, he was like, done. I'm sold. Let's do it. 90 days. And in that 90 days, we told him exactly what he had to do. And if he did not make that happen in 90 days, he was gone. So it was come, almost like a 90-day report card, and we both agreed in writing that if he didn't meet these certain standards and these certain metrics, if these things were not accomplished, then he would be gone, and we would both part ways as friends. He could not come back and sue us, et cetera. And that's a great way to meet someone because, as Luke said, resumes are a bunch of fluff. We all know that. Half the stuff on resumes is not true or outdated. You can't really learn much about trusting someone and really knowing someone's work ethic by a resume. So that 90 days will reveal a whole lot. So definitely check out that book, Traction, uh, by Gino Wickman. Highly recommend that one. The other ones, I'll just read them off real quick and I'll put them in the notes. Good to Great by Jim Collins. Any of the Jim Collins books are awesome. And then uh, Blue Ocean Strategy which kind of ties into what we did, right? Blue ocean versus red ocean. Red ocean means, you know, you guys are all fishermen listening to this. It means you got a lot of freaking sharks in the ocean. Like it's a bunch of blood. It's, you know, price competition. You're trying to slash everything to outdo your competitor. And it's just, it's just hardcore competition. Blue ocean means you're the only one out there. Nice, calm seas. And so the whole book is about finding something that you can do a little bit differently. Not necessarily there's no competition. That's almost impossible. But that you're almost creating your own little, uh, you, you know, you, your own little industry essentially right look and that's kind of what we're doing in fishing education is that I mean, we're, we're really creating our own little niche if you will where yes there is certainly some competition but we're just building this thing like uh like there's not we're in the apparel industry good lord i mean it was just all about slashing prices and having sales every week etc it was uh it was not really fun for us some people are awesome at it god bless you but it was uh it was not for us so those are the books that i highly recommend uh but the first two traction and then uh, the why book. Know, know your why. Start with why. Those are awesome ones. Anything else, Lukey? I think that covers it. Cool. Phone's still, phone's still got a little battery. All right. Perfect timing. Well, that was a good one. That went uh, longer than I think any of our other podcasts, but I feel like this is a really valuable one for those of you that, that do want to go out and try something. And just remember that Mark Twain one. I'm going to read it again. It's a great way to end the show. 20 years from now, you will be more disappointed by the things that you didn't do by the ones that you did. So throw off the bow lines, sail away from the safe Harbor, catch the trade winds in your sails, explore, dream, discover. That is awesome. That is it for this episode. If you have any questions, please do let us know fish 
at saltstrong.com is the best email. And then please, if you made it this far and you're not an insider member, it is risk-free for an entire year. It's like a one-year trial. No one else is doing anything out there like it. That's how much we believe in it. So you do not risk a penny for an entire year. So if you want to catch more fish, become more consistent, and have more fun, go to saltstrong.com forward slash podcast or forward slash insider. But forward slash podcast is the best way to get the best deal right now. And we will get you in the club as long as you are a fit. We'd love to have you yep. as part of the family. Yeah, right now that's that's really specific for snook, redfish, trout, and obviously we, we cover some tarpon too. But those are the core three, and we're going to be building onto that too. So as Joe said, we're going to have some offshore stuff coming up soon. Um, and you better believe it, that price is going to be increasing as we add those extra fish on there. So anyhow, give it, check it out. If you like inshore fishing, you're going to absolutely love the club. Yep. Don't forget flounder. All, awesome. all inshore fish. We just had a couple great flounder tips by uh, by CA. So, yeah, anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed that. I hope that you do have the courage and understand your why, where you can't go out and start your own business. I, I this whole hour and twenty minutes, it will make it so worth it if we hear one story. So please, if you do go out and do something, or even if you just need a little help or a few more questions, please do reach out to us. Fish at saltstrom.com is the best. Uh, will will make sure it gets to uh, to us, and we can reach out to you. We do want to help people because we had a lot of people help us along the way. And I, I want to give a quick shout out. Tom Rowland, Saltwater Experience, he was one of those guys, and this actually covers one of the questions that helped us out. I just reached out to him, and that dude was just so helpful. He'd been there. He'd done it. He knew the industry, and, and he really gave us a lot of great guidance. So there's great people out there that will help you. You just got to ask, so don't be afraid to ask us. We want to help you, and we, want to get, we just want to get more people out fishing. So if your job or your idea can help do that, we're in. That's it for this episode. Joe Simons, Luke Simons, over and out.